What's up you guys, Rex here. So this first week of the semester in medical school was so great, I have to make a second video. And so this one will be on how sound localization works. So this was really cool for me to learn about because I was biomedical engineering in undergrad. And so I already had learned a ton about sort of the physics of sound and how it is so amazing how we do sound localization. But now I actually know a little bit of how the neural circuitry is such that this is possible and makes it work. So first, let me define sound localization. That is our ability to know the direction that a source of sound is coming from. And so this is something you've been able to do since you were very young and you just instinctively can do it. So if you close your eyes and snap, you just know it's coming from the left you know it's coming from the right, you know it's coming from there, 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 doesn't matter where, you just know where it's coming from because your brain is subconsciously processing this information and making it happen. So let's start with the physics of how this is really cool. So if we draw a little head, which will be the ugliest head ever with two ears, so this is a top-down view. First, we need to understand a little bit about sound. Sound is actually a pressure wave that is actually making the molecules in the air get closer together and farther apart and then that's hitting onto our eardrums and making it vibrate and that goes through the cochlea all kinds of cool stuff happens which maybe that's a video for another time but then that turns into an actual electrical response in our neurons sends action potentials and then our brain processes it so if we think about a sound wave it's really sort of a completely spherical so we'll have like x marks the sound source that it is a completely spherical wave going out but it's easier to represent it in sort of a plot that if we have sound we'll draw our source here sound is coming and we can draw it as a nice sine wave where technically our graph would be like pressure on the y-axis and our x-axis we could either say like is time or is distance and it's so it's traveling along so there's an interesting thing of where we use actually two different methods to determine where sound is coming from the first is timing based and so this is what we use for sound that is less than about three kilohertz and so just for reference humans can hear about 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz in frequency and so what that frequency is is it's how often something is vibrating per second so 20 times per second is pretty fast 20,000 times per second is super fast so we can do timing for only up to about 3,000 Hertz so the reason for this is is if we imagine some sound source here X marks the spot and we mark where we'll just say that this is our we'll put eyes here ugliest eyes ever we'll say so that's the right ear that's the left ear if we have something that is a really low frequency sound and so it comes and it has a wave like that and so we can see here that our right and left ears are seeing different parts of the wave so we can like we'll say that like that's our graph that's our baseline so our right ear sees it at this part of the wave in our left ear sees it at that part of the wave. And so that's easy to distinguish. But now if you imagine something that is a higher frequency such that it goes through, now what our ears see is potentially the exact same thing. And so it's impossible to distinguish the timing difference because our ears are actually seeing the same thing that it's now like in phase, so to speak, and no longer out of phase because of the difference. So the other method our ears do is to use the actual loudness difference. Now, this loudness difference isn't actually that significant when you have low frequency noise that is below 3000 kilohertz, just because of the way sound works that low frequency noises are better at getting around objects. However, high frequency noises are not very good at getting around objects. So now if we imagine that sound is coming from here in order to get to the right ear, it has a nice straight shot path. To get to the left ear, it actually will have to go and then sort of loop around the ear and get over to our left side. And in the process, it actually is going to have a significant decrease in noise. And so I think a better representation of how that's working is remember these are actually spherical waves. And so this spherical wave, it's gonna hit this right ear first but it actually will have a much harder path 
of actually getting to and sort of bending around to get to our left ear. And so that actually brings in a much more complicated amount of processing that's going on in our brain if we think about how there is a difference of where our sound source is, whether it's here or here or here or here, that there are going to be different paths that impact both our timing difference and our loudness difference. So if you imagine our timing difference is going to be one thing if it goes from here to here, but it's gonna be a more significant timing difference if it's coming from here and that path and that path. Additionally, if we're talking about loudness difference, that depends very much on where the sound is coming from. So if we're going to our right ear from here, pretty straight shot, left ear, only a little bit of a curve to get around stuff. If we have it from this point here, now it goes straight to the right ear and a much more significant path to get to the left ear. And this is complicated by the fact that the amount of attenuation caused by going around our head is very frequency dependent. So our hearing has to know, okay, is this going to be a 10 kilohertz noise? So we should expect this amount of decrease in loudness between our right ear and the left ear for 10 kilohertz. And so if we think about all of the processing our brain has to do is that it interprets, okay, we'll say that this ear hears a sound that is 5% louder than this ear. First, it has to know, okay, what frequency is this sound? Then based on that frequency, it has to map, all right, a 5% difference is maybe what I can predict for a 45 degree angle. If it was a 6% difference, maybe it would be a 50 degree angle. A 10% difference, it would be a 80 degree angle. Oh, but if this was a 17 kilohertz noise, it would be totally different values. And so our brain has to do all of that processing to figure this stuff out, and it's totally amazing. And just by the way, those 10%, 5%, totally arbitrary. I do not know exactly what decibel decrease you would expect from one side of your ear to the other. So now, how does this actually work in the brain? This is the really cool stuff that I just learned about this week. So the way this works is the cochlea inside our ear takes the sound and it converts it into an electrical signal and that comes through into the brain and so it gets to some sort of place in a nucleus on our right side we'll say and our left side and so i know the names of these and we learned about them that's not important for this video but just some nucleus in the brain imagine some cell gets to here and it now sends its signals to a different nucleus in the brain and so i'll just label this for pretty much my sake that this is part of the olivary nucleus and so the way these brains send these axons is in a really cool branching pattern and it sends them to different cells and this left side will send branching here so now the way these neurons work which i will color over in green is they are programmed and they physiologically work such that they only send a signal when they receive two inputs at the exact same time. If one comes before the other, no signal output. If one comes at the exactly same time as another, then it sends a signal output. So now if we think about it, the path along this right axon to, we'll just say that this is, you know, number one, and then this is number four, because why not? All right, so to get to neuron number one, right will have a very short path and left will have a long path. And so a longer path just takes more time. And so this will only reach at exactly the same time if we have a sound source coming from somewhere on the left where it reaches the left first and then reaches the right. And so this will then even out this path difference that it was an actual external physical path difference of an external source of sound getting to our left ear first and then getting to our right ear. But now to get to this neuron number one, there is a much shorter axon path length from our right side into this center and a much longer path length from our left side to the right. And so in between all of these different neurons, depending which one is activated, our brain knows how much the timing difference was between our different ears, and therefore it's able to figure out, all right, is it coming from the left or the right? Again, this only really works under 3000 kilohertz. So now let's go to the case of above 3000 kilohertz. All right, so now let's draw out how this actual loudness difference works out. So we'll draw a couple nuclei, 
in the brain and so we'll imagine that this is our right side and this is our left side and so we'll put a couple there a couple there a couple here a couple here and so now all of these are connected by axons and so i'm going to draw a green axon that is denoting that it is trying to activate a action potential in the cell that it's going to so this is trying to activate this purple nucleus and the purple nucleus is trying to activate the blue nucleus Similarly, this black nucleus is trying to activate this purple one on the left side, which is trying to activate the purple one on the blue side. However, at the same time, I will draw red, denoting that it is trying to deactivate that neuron. And so this purple is trying to deactivate the opposite purple, and similarly trying to deactivate this opposite purple. And so now what happens is if we imagine that there is a signal that is very loud on this right side and kind of quiet on the left side, what happens is, is that this purple one gets only a little bit of activation. So now I have to remember back to make sure that you understand the fact that action potentials is sort of an all or nothing thing. And so the way it's coded is by probably frequency and how often it's happening. So this is happening very frequently on the right and not too frequently on the left. So there is going to be activation of this purple and there's gonna be a little bit of deactivation on this right side, but that is not enough to overcome the massive activation on the right. So there's gonna be a little bit of deactivation here, little bit of trying to increase here. Now on the right, there is going to be very significant activation, very significant deactivation, such that by the time we get to this level, there is essentially no activation on the left side and very significant activation on the right side. And so therefore our brain is able to really magnify the difference in loudness that starts off very tiny because there isn't really a ton of difference between the right side and the left side of our head and how loud it's gonna be. So it has to have this circuit to really magnify this difference. And so you can actually graph out sort of what you're expecting. And so on our X axis, we're gonna say that this is like distance to the left or right. So this is a sound very far to the right, and this is a sound very far to the left. And here we will graph the actual response of the two different things. So we will be graphing the response of these neurons here because this is what's actually being interpreted as our right and left. And so I will actually just color code this again. And this time we will color code where left and right. And so left is going to equal, we'll have it this gold color. And we'll say that right equals the blue color. And so if we have something very far to the right, there's gonna be very significant activation and it will decrease as its sound to the left. Similarly, if we have something very far to the left, it's going to have very significant activation decrease down to here. And so now our brain is very easily able to interpret this difference here to determine how far to the right or how far to the left something is. And notably, you can imagine the scenario where it's directly in front of or behind us where that or is going to be equal loudness in our right and our left side. And so there's gonna be some sort of just minimal response of both where they're sort of equally canceling each other out such that there's not much response in either the right or the left and it's very equal. So to determine how it is, whether it's down below us or up and above, we actually use much more complicated cues based on how it's actually hitting our ear and that's changing the pitch. And so that's a story for another time and very complicated. This video is already really long. So we'll leave it at that. Super cool physics. Also maybe even cooler neuroanatomy of how this circuit is built into our brain and genetics determine that circuit. And it's incredibly complicated and amazing to me that our brains are able to develop in such a way that this works in all humans all the time. Absolutely marvelous. Love human anatomy. Love the brain. Even if I'm not super interested in going into medicine with the brain, still super cool. So if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, I'd love to hear about them down below. I'll read and respond to every single comment. Make sure you subscribe, hit the notification bell if you want to catch more of my videos as I learn cool things in medical school. As always, like the video if you like the video, dislike the video if you dislike the video. And until next time, don't be ordinary. Go be great.